Good evening all and thank you for joining us for another Secret Sunday session today. Today I'm joined by Steph um, and we have brought Steph in today to talk about endometriosis, um, something that I am not as much familiar with and that's why we're going to be talking to Steph about what she does in her practice and get some insight into it because a lot of women do experience um, endometriosis and it can be really challenging for them so we're going to dive into that today so to kick us off today Steph do you want to just explain to everyone who you are and what is it that you are doing? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Ash, and the introduction. So my name is Stephanie Balakis, and I'm the accredited practicing dietitian and nutritionist. And my realm of expertise lies in all things reproductive health and fertility nutrition. And um, yeah, more recently, in the last couple of years, I've kind of found more of my home and passion in managing endometriosis using diet and lifestyle. And that really stemmed from receiving my own diagnosis in December 2019, um, which was actually came about due to my clients that I was seeing at the time. So, yeah, I love working with people to help them explore their options when it comes to managing endometriosis, which we know is right now an incurable disease um, and a disease that has a significant impact on many people's lives and so yeah I'm really just trying to raise awareness for the role that nutrition can play in managing endo and giving people those tools and being really practical um, and helping people as well break out of the diets that they're being shoved down their throat on Instagram, that they have to do this and they have to do that. When in reality, for the vast majority of people, that's not necessary, not necessary at all. So yeah, I work virtually with all of our clients online. We see clients all over the world, myself and my team. And most of our clients have endometriosis, but we do also see a variety of other presentations as well. Um, my business is called The Dietologist. You can find us online at thedietologist.com.au and I am also run a podcast. So I keep pretty busy and two Instagram accounts. So that's, that's, that's always keeps you busy. <laughs> Amazing. Congratulations on that journey and starting up the business. And I'm sure that you are making such an impact on so many people's lives. For the purposes of the interview, we will refer to endometriosis as endo. I think it's just easier to shorten that. Um, yeah. So people are aware as well. Um, so with that, how did you go experiencing your own form of endo and how was that experience for you? Yeah, I it, like many people, it started years before I realised, you know, I even knew the word what endometriosis was. Um, so as I was studying um, my degree, so I did a science degree and then became a dietitian, which is like the standard kind of pathway now. Um, but at the time I was experiencing changes in my bowel habits and bloating and um, abdominal pain and I was breakthrough bleeding on the pill all the time and I was going to the GP all the time wondering, you know, like what's going on here? Like something's not right. Is my gut like... Is, I, I just couldn't make heads or tails of it. And because I had that kind of background in physiology and health, I was trying to find my own answers at the same time. And yeah, I, I did raise the question to one of my GPs, like, could this be endometriosis? Is it possible? And they were like, no, it's not possible because you're on the pill and that's the solution for endo anyway, which heads up is not accurate information. Um, Well-meaning GP, but you know not up to speed on what what it is and I didn't know enough about it at the time either you don't learn about endometriosis in your dietetics degree so um I was like okay you know just moved on so I ended up getting um lots of bowel investigations whilst I was studying um and they ended up finding that I had an ulcer in a very strange part of my bowel. And also um, I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, which many people with endometriosis also experience. So it's about 50 to 75% of people with endometriosis may also qualify for a diagnosis of IBS. 
And I'm not alone in many people being misdiagnosed with IBS before actually receiving an endometriosis diagnosis. So I went off and tried to manage my IBS using diet. Um, so the low FODMAP diet is a research-based diet that can help with the management of IBS. So I decided to embark on that, put my dietitian at this point, I was qualified, put my dietitian hat on on myself and started to try to get to the bottom of my symptoms of bloating and gas and swinging between constipation and diarrhea. At this point, I was still using contraceptive pills. So the period symptoms were not particularly prevalent for me. Um, I did have some like pelvic pain, but it was very not chronic as in I would be driving and I would get like a little twinge of something. I'd be like, oh, what's that? Um, but I started to notice things change when I decided to come off the pill for a period of about six months because I wanted to see what was going on. My degree of suspicion that it was endometriosis started to grow and I wanted to work out what was happening without any kind of pill. Um, so I came off the pill for about six months. My period regulated very quickly and every single month it got slightly heavier and slightly more painful. I wouldn't say I fit into the classic uh, endometriosis symptom profile, which we can talk about, but um, I, I guess I was just very in tune with my body and I knew what was normal, what wasn't, because by this stage I was actually seeing other clients with endometriosis. I was working in reproductive health. Um, and fertility and PCOS. So I, I kind of knew what was normal, what was abnormal. And I started to understand what I was experiencing wasn't normal. And I wanted to intervene early if I did have endometriosis. So got to a point where I ended up seeing a gynecologist anyway, for other reasons, because I'd had a positive um, me. And so I needed to go and get that checked out anyway. So I ended up in the gynecologist office who happened to look across the hall from me at the time. Um, it's really fun when you're working in the gynecology space because you pretty much know every gynecologist in your area. So uh, yeah, you just have to pick one <laughs> and just get become really good friends. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just mentioned to him, I said, look, I, I think I have potentially endometriosis he's like okay tell me what why what symptoms do you have and so I came in like really prepared I was like no I have all these breakthrough bleeds my period's been getting worse I've got all these bowel symptoms you know they were told me I had IBS but some to think maybe it's not I'm experiencing painful sex like you know what's going on and he's like okay when are you free for surgery so um I was had to work around my schedule with the business. So I ended up going in for surgery two days before Christmas. And yeah, I had, they found stage two endometriosis. I recovered really well from my surgery. I know that's not the case for a lot of people, um, but I recovered really well. I chose to have the Marina IUD inserted. That was something I was going to do anyway, endo or no endo. Um, and that's worked really well for me. I know a lot of people with endometriosis really don't love the marina and that's totally fine I'm super aware that it doesn't stop endometriosis growing back mm -hmm. I'm also aware of the increased risks of having ovarian cysts but that's just not how my endometriosis presents I do not get big cysts um, the way that my surgeon described it it was like you kind of had bubble wrap um, consistency of endometriosis in certain patches of the body so um, I was very lucky to not have any tubes blocked or ovaries you know compromised by endometriosis but I did notice a significant improvement in some of my pain and it's surprisingly all my FODMAP intolerance has pretty much dissipated after my surgery so that really confirmed to me that it wasn't IBS so um, yeah and then from there I, I kind of just continued to feel really frustrated on behalf of the endometriosis community for the lack of um, awareness um, and how long it took me so that process like I really condensed it although I do jibber jabber on a lot but you know that I probably just summarized about four to five years mm. of stuff um <laughs> that that didn't all happen in a straight line so uh yeah I, I'm not shorter than most the average in Australia at the moment is between six and seven years from onset of symptoms and diagnosis and a lot of people get symptoms from their first period so imagine 11 year olds and 12 year olds getting their first period 
and experiencing these symptoms and being told it's normal. Um, and I think that's what needs to change is we need to denormalize period pain. Period pain is not normal. And I think that the statistics of one in nine of people with endometriosis is, is, is probably a lot higher than that. I think a lot of people go undiagnosed. A lot of people are misdiagnosed. And I think the rate of endometriosis we're going to see is going to climb um, if we continue to you know, create awareness and educate people about their bodies and what's normal, what's not normal. Um, and there's probably a million different reasons why that why that rate is going to in, incline. But yeah, I guess that's my story. And my story really helped me want to give back to the community because I felt really frustrated with the options. The options are have surgery on repeat every few, until you get into pain again, then we do surgery again. And every time you create scar tissue, which isn't great for your long-term fertility, if you choose to have children um, or if you choose to try to have children, um, there's the infertility component. 30 to 50% of people might have troubles conceiving with endometriosis. You know, organs get lost due to endometriosis in severe cases. Um, and the impact on on day-to-day -day quality of life, mental health, all these concerns, I, I felt almost like a bit of an imposter, if I'm honest, when I was diagnosed, because I felt like my symptoms were not that bad. I had clients who were debilitated by endometriosis that I was seeing who were unable to work, unable to go to university, and here I am running a business pretty much feeling fine 99% of the time, um, but I still had endo. And so what I realised was, I was like, well, hang on a second, so many people are going to share that uh, story too and don't know and they're just walking around. And I'm lucky because I had my clients to be a mirror and also I had my own knowledge and health literacy to be able to go and get this sorted out sooner because most people don't find out till they have more progressed endometriosis in many cases. So, yeah, I think that's probably enough about my story in a nutshell but <laughs> hopefully that was helpful and resonated with some people in some way no I think it definitely would because there is I feel so many similar stories in this space that people can relate mm -hmm. to because that misdiagnosis is such a big thing and I want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that do you think it's mainly um, doctors and GPs misdiagnosing people or it's conversations within family groups and friends going oh no period pain's normal you know I had really bad mm -hmm. pain and people dismiss it the both. I think, I think as a society, we have, you know, normalized that it's normal for somebody who has a period to be in bed, to need neurofern, to need a hot pack, to need days off school or work, to not participate in PE at school, to not go for a swim, to not have sex, whatever it is. But we've normalised as society. It's like for one week of the month, we don't do those things. And if you have a period every month, that's three months out of the year and you add that up over your life, it's a lot of years lost mm -hmm. to your period. And so I think, I think it's a combination of both. And there are amazing doctors out there. Like I think doctors cop a lot of flack as well where maybe it's not due. There are amazing doctors out there. But I think as well, like, and hopefully my story can help people is you need to come in suspecting what you suspect and present the information. I know that's not how it should be. I'm aware that that's not how the system should work. Mm. But if you want to get your answers and you want to get your diagnosis, you want to get your treatment, you're going to have to do a bit of advocacy on your behalf. You can't walk in there and be like, so I'm having some period pain. Mm. Yeah. Because the state of play right now, sadly, and I don't agree that this is right, but to help you, whoever's listening, mm. my recommendation would not be to do that. Yeah. My recommendation would be to go in with some kind of information. You've tracked your period. You've tracked your symptoms. You've got a short list of what's going on. Yeah. And you can say, hey, this has happened. This has happened. This has happened. This has happened. Endometriosis is common. It should be one of the number top five things that they should be thinking mm -hmm. and a lot of people are like oh I've gotten an ultrasound scan no endometriosis found that's not good enough mm -hmm. a pelvic ultrasound 
cannot show endometriosis in most instances unless you have gotten to the stage where things are stuck together or you've got significant cyst forming on the ovaries. In most instances, most normal pelvic ultrasounds, there's more in-depth ones, but even the in-depth ones, every time I go for an in-depth one, they're like, all clear. And I'm like, I have symptoms. I know it's growing back. Like, I know in my brain, it's just, it hides in between organs. It sticks to abdominal walls. It sticks to peritoneum. You can't see that on an ultrasound. So um, just be aware of people dismissing the possibility of endometriosis without the proper steps to being diagnosed. If it walks like a duck or talks like a duck, it might be a duck, but the only way you're going to work out if it's a duck or not is to go for surgery and see. And I think that's the main barrier. Most people don't want to go for surgery because they're like, what if there's nothing? I just cut myself open for what? I recover for what? Take time off work for what? It's not a blood test. It's not a scan, which is annoying enough as it is, especially when you've got pain with something in there. So like, I think this is the barrier. Like if we were able to diagnose it without surgery I think it would make such a difference mm. but we're not there yet and I think as well we're a bit almost sur surgery shy um, mm. in that way and I appreciate that but to truly get the answer that's what we need to do and I think as well um, we're, we're discouraging people because we don't want to do unnecessary surgery which I understand but also, you can't live your life in pain and suffering either. Mm. And for a lot of people may not even be aware of what endometriosis is. Can mm. you talk about what actually it is and how it forms or how it grows in the body? Yes, absolutely. So endometriosis is the chronic inflammatory condition. Um, it's generally classed as a reproductive health disorder, but it really presents oftentimes as a whole body disease. A lot of symptoms don't fall into the reproductive category at all. Things like fatigue, things like iron deficiencies, things like food intolerances, bowel symptoms. I mean, all organ systems, but most of the time it's being managed by reproductive health doctors like gynecologists, for example. And so it is the presence of endometrial-like cells growing in places it's not meant to. So the endometrium is the bit that lines the uterus. So it's that lining that gets shed every month. And it's a cell that used to be said that it's the endometrium gone rogue, but it's actually not the exact same cell structure. It's similar. Um, it can respond to hormones in a similar way, but it starts to translocate and grow elsewhere. And we don't actually know why. There's lots of theories. Lots of theories have been ruled in and ruled out. Um, the most you know, well understood theory is potentially um, the immune system has had some kind of dysfunction because the immune system probably should have attacked the rogue, any kind of cell that's not meant to be growing somewhere. Your immune system's really meant to mount an attack and try to kill it off. Um, and maybe there's some kind of mechanism that endometriosis is doing to the immune system to override that function. So that's one potential theory. There's lots of other theories um, as to why it can occur, but we don't really know. But it does create a state of inflammation in the pelvis, uh, and that can contribute to pain in and of itself. And also a lot of people with endometriosis also experience hormonal issues. So um, it's generally speaking and this is not universally true but a lot of people with endometriosis have a lot of excess estrogen it's an estrogen linked disease um, and so that can come along with its own symptom set on top of endometriosis as well so that's what endometriosis is in a nutshell and I think it probably needs a better understanding of what's causing it to, for us to work out how to better diagnose it and treat slash cure it yeah and can it spread anywhere in the body pretty much um endometriosis has been found in some pretty far-reaching places so a lot of people think oh it's just my uterus and ovaries and tubes but no um bowel bladder ligaments um the diaphragm which is the thin lining of tissue that separates your lungs from your intestines there's been endo found in lungs i think once in the brain and once in the eye so yeah it can really take over the whole body in some ways mm -hmm. um, but most 
I mean, those are rare instances, I would say, but most of the time it's in the abdominal cavity um, that we would be looking for endometriosis. Um, in the rectum, it's been found. Um, there's lots of places endometriosis can, can be found. Um, and so that's why, you know, it can be frustrating to be managed as a reproductive disease when all these different organ systems are being compromised. Um, and it's really hard to find a doctor who's a gastrointestinal doctor who knows about endometriosis, for example, if you have bowel endo, which is very common. Yeah, wow. Um, it's phenomenal to even hear that. Like I had no idea that it can be found in places like the brain, like such a mm. different area to be targeted. But it's it's something, I, I guess, that I just said, it's rogue and it's it attacks and that's something that we really need to deal with. Um, yeah. When we talk about the signs and the symptoms, what are the most common that someone can experience? Yeah, I think before I get into the signs and symptoms, what I always like to like <laughs> proceed this conversation with, you could have one, none or all of these or something different and you can still have endometriosis. So the same disease can present so differently, but these are some of the most common ones mm -hmm. and the most common being is pelvic pain. So pelvic pain refers to period pain. It refers to pain with ovulation. And it also refers to non-cyclical pelvic pain. So as in, it doesn't really relate to your menstrual cycle. That's the most common one. Heavy bleeding is very common as well during your period. And non-cyclical bleeding can be a, a symptom as well, which is something I experience quite significantly. So spotting when you're not meant to be spotting, for example. Um, the heavy bleeding can come with or without clots and often leads to nutrient deficiencies, fatigue and iron deficiency being the most prevalent, sometimes anemia. Um, fatigue is, I think, a, almost like a universal symptom. And gastrointestinal symptoms. So bloating is by far one of the biggest complaints endometriosis clients have, uh, fondly known as endo belly, not so fondly, but um, we can get quite significant abdominal distension. It feels very hard. Um, and it's, it's, it almost feels like you're bloated, but it, it's, it's kind of different. It's hard to explain. It's almost like a sense of like inflammation and bloated have like combined to give you like a super bloat. It's an awful experience. Um, constipation, diarrhea, and or gas is also common. A lot of people with endometriosis also complain of nausea um, and that can come due to secondary to the pain or separate to. Um, and then we also have other kind of, I guess, accessory symptoms that commonly co-occur. So things like poor mood, um, depression, anxiety, and sometimes that can be um, secondary to the impacts that endometriosis is having on, on your life. So if you're not able to participate in work, school, social events, your relationship, naturally there's going to be implications to your mental health. I think that's a pretty obvious connection that most of us can make. Um, what am I missing? Pain with sex, pain with bowels opening, pain with urination. I never experienced pain with urination, but I did notice that the way that I did pee after my surgery did change even though I didn't really have any endo on my bladder um, so I guess it was it's really hard to describe but it's almost like um, it's almost like urinary constipation I think that's like the best kind of way to describe it so imagine the sensation of constipation but like with urine so like you've got to go you're trying to go then you start going doesn't feel like it's coming out fast enough or like smooth enough and then like it's it, it just it's such an odd thing but a lot of people say oh pain with urination I'm like pain with urination we think of a UTI which is like yeah. a different thing this is like a different mm. sensation I'm like what's the best way to describe that so people can wrap their heads around it um but I've also seen clients who've had you know very few of these symptoms and I think one of the biggest symptoms of endometriosis which people forget about is infertility a lot of people do not get diagnosed with endometriosis till they're trying to conceive um I think the latest stat was I 
think it was up to 50% of people aren't finding out till they're trying to conceive. And so a lot of people are like, oh, I'm asymptomatic endo or I have silent endo, but I'm trying to conceive. I'm like, well, actually, it's not asymptomatic. Infertility is your symptom. You've just redefined it in your mind slightly differently. But infertility is a symptom. And I distinctly recall working with one person who had recurrent um, uh, un recurrent unsuccessful cycles with IVF and the, so the doctor decided to do a surgery just to make sure that endometriosis wasn't at play and she was like oh, I'm just jumping through the hoops I don't think I have endo and I was like no oh, never say never you can never be too sure and yeah she had quite significant endo found um, and it was all removed and I, I asked her to reflect like you know looking back She's like, actually, now that I think about it, I had chronic back pain. I was going to the physio for years trying to sort this back pain out and now it's gone. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> wow. that's wild. So like the way it presents is so different. Like that client, for example, had infertility and chronic low back pain. Wow. You wouldn't connect those two things and say, oh, that's endometriosis. And that's why it is hard to diagnose. And, you know, credit where credit's due, like from a medical perspective, it's really hard. That's really hard because you're putting someone in a position where they're paying for an expensive surgery mm. that, yeah, there's always a possibility. There may not be anything there, but you know, and it's there's crazy. always a possibility it can be too. Yeah. And it's crazy to hear those signs and symptoms that you're mentioning because in conversations mm. that I have with girls or even discussing my own period and the pain that I may experience or other people experience, and you talk about it like it's normal. Like mm -hmm. it's just an, a normal thing to have a period that you have a bit of pain or you have lower back pain or I get it the week before or I get it the week of. And it's mm. common knowledge that that is an experience with your period. And to hear mm -hmm. that that's not okay I think a lot of people need to hear that because we accept it as normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, like a lot of people will then ask, well, like, oh, are you saying when I have my period, I should just feel nothing at all? And I'm not saying, I mean, some people do and like lucky them, but um, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, is if you are making special accommodations for yourself around your period, and it's not just like, oh, I'm just extra tired today. I need to go to bed early. Or, oh, I'm feeling a bit more like lacking in energy today because I'm on my period. Or, yeah, I can feel like a bit of a heaviness here and I, I might just go get myself a heat pack or something just to feel a bit more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Really, that should actually be the maximum that we're tolerating. <laughs> it shouldn't be like, I need to have Nurofen two days before. Otherwise, I'm going to get hit like a truck and I won't be able to go to work or school or uni. And it's like, okay, that's not, that's not right. That's, that's abnormal. Um, and then the other one that a lot of people say is like, oh, I can feel myself ovulating, but it's not necessarily painful. Does that mean I have endometriosis? And some people can feel themselves ovulating. Very handy when you're trying to conceive. But um, that, that experience can be norm, normal, normal. A lot of people, though, may not have any period pain and experience ovulation pain as if they were having their period. They need the hot pack. They need to rest. They feel that they're, they're experiencing a lot of those symptoms around the time of ovulation. I think at that stage, I would classify that as abnormal. Mm -hmm. I think it's about the whole picture, though. Like, we can isolate any one of these things and be like, oh, that's me. I feel fatigued. I'm like, oh, who doesn't feel fatigued? But, like... We can isolate any one of those things and, and suspect, but I think as well, like we need to look at the whole picture. There's lots of things we need to consider, rule in, rule out, but we can never take endometriosis off the table until really that, that last step has been taken with a laparoscopy. Like even if it's a low degree of suspicion, I think we always, like in my opinion, this is just my opinion, but my opinion I always have it on the table in the back of my mind when I'm working with clients and they, even one little seed is planted. I'm just like, mm, can't rule out endometriosis just yet. Mm -hmm. And I even bring it up to them. I've even had clients where I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, but I think it's worth exploring. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I can't guarantee it. It's just, this is my thoughts. I don't know if anyone's discussed this with you before, but look, let's, let's not rule it out prematurely because it could be there and that that can delay that 
ruling it out too soon can delay the diagnosis. You know, I've seen that delay diagnosis for decades. So it's really important that we, um, and even on the other side, like people that have had children, oh, well, you can't have endometriosis because you had children. Mm. This is not true. A lot of people get diagnosed later in life. It happened even just in my family recently at 45 after two children conceived, no problems, endometriosis and adenomyosis diagnosed. And so at 45. <laughs> so it's really important that we don't, um, and same with teenagers, like vice versa, like it can affect any age. And so I think we can't say, oh, this is the picture of endometriosis. You know, it's, it, this is what everybody will look like. It is extremely diverse who it affects. Yeah. Wow. It, um, oh, it just sounds like something that is not talked about enough or there's not enough education about it. Um, but then I want to look a little bit at the treatments for endometriosis. Mm. Um, we do know that it's incurable at this stage, but what mm -hmm. is available for people that need treatment for it? Yeah. Not much is the, is the short answer. Um, so at the moment, what we can do about endometriosis is we can go in surgically and excise it, which means cut it out. And that is important in the diagnosis of endometriosis because we actually need to send it to pathology to confirm it is endo because lots of things can grow anywhere really um lots of sinister things too endometriosis is sinister but it it isn't actually going to can, i don't want to be overly dramatic but it can't kill you as in it's not like cancer for example however it can it can kill parts of you in the, in a more metaphorical way and there has sadly been actually people that have lost their lives as a result of mismanagement of endometriosis and surgery is going wrong and you know people can then rely on pain medication and there can be mental health consequences and there are like lots of really serious consequences because of the mismanagement of endometriosis and so I think that's really important to, to keep on top of but in terms of treatment excision surgery that is thorough and as infrequent as possible ideally is our best chance of management I wouldn't even say it's treatment I would say it's management because the the recurrence rate of endometriosis right now is high so about 40 to 80 percent of people with endometriosis are going to have a recurrence at some stage in their life after their initial surgery so a lot of people are on a bit of a merry-go-round of frequent surgeries trying to get relief trying to get more more of it out mm -hmm. what I always say to people though is a lot of people have this expectation that once they have surgery they'll feel better they'll just go back to their you know pre pre-morbid life as we say in clinical world like pre-symptomatic life um, and that can be the case for a number of people but for a number of other people that is not the case and even if the surgery is done really well it can it can create symptoms afterwards and a lot of people were like well how it's gone like the physical presence of endometriosis is gone and so I think what we're beginning to understand is there are other systems that are involved in endometriosis that are not just the reproductive system. One of which I think is particularly relevant is the nervous system. And so just because the physical endometriosis is out, your nervous system has been absorbing pain from that region of your body for potentially years. And so just because the physical aspect is gone, I always say your brain has become trained for pain. And so that aspect of it, may not actually change immediately after a surgery and you may need other supportive things to look at you know pelvic physiotherapy acupuncture nutrition there's lots of other pain psychology there's lots of other supportive therapies that we need to be considering when it comes to management in the long term if we're trying to stretch people out as long as possible between surgeries which is ideal so at the moment, that's what we have for management. A lot of people go on to a variety of different 
you know, hormone suppressants. So um, trying to suppress the period so you don't get a period, so you don't get period pain, for example. But these are all things that are just symptom management. It's not actually stopping endometriosis grow back. There used to be this rhetoric of, you know, if we put progesterone in there, it'll ward off the excess estrogen and that won't let endo grow. And we know now that that's actually not true at all. So just because I have the marina in doesn't mean endo won't grow back or it will grow back slower or when you're pregnant endo doesn't grow or you can't experience endo symptoms when you're pregnant none of those things are actually true you can experience it anytime some people get little endo holidays i call them sometimes people do and that's great sometimes people don't and that's okay too um so look i think that's really like the hormone side is really symptom control. The mm -hmm. surgery is trying to actually remove it. And then we really got to look beyond that and into our other tools in our toolbox, as I like to say about how can we manage, can we be optimizing the diet to have more anti-inflammatory nutrition to help with pelvic pain? Yes, you know, if we need to be looking at gastrointestinal symptoms, what can we be doing there to manage any residual gastrointestinal sy symptoms? Diet's relevant there. If we're having pain with sex still um, or pain with opening bowels or ongoing constipation issues, pelvic physio can be really, really valuable to help work on your pelvic floor, to help you relax and help you get um, uh, like desensitize, sensitize. I don't know which direction it is. I'm no expert. I've talked to quite a few pelvic physios. I know a, a little about it, but I'm no expert. But pelvic physios are invaluable for endometriosis because a lot of people with endo have very overactive tight pelvic floors because you've always been in pain. So the pelvic floor's just been doing this. And so, yes, if you even, for some people, even inserting a tampon is really painful. Mm -hmm. And so, all those things are things that we can be looking at. Acupuncture can help with nervous system getting more calmed down as well. There's other evidence for acupuncture for endometriosis. Some supplements can be viable. Um, pain management psychology, seeing a pain specialist. There's more and more research coming out about the use of cannabis and CBD for endo. So there's lots of non-medical or allied health strategies that you could consider for endometriosis management in the long term um, but the traditional medical approach is the surgery and typically a lot of surgeons want to use hormone suppressants but you don't have to like you can speak up and be like I don't want that or it's not going to work if you're going to have surgery so you can try to have a baby so that's really not going to work is it you don't want hormone suppressants in that instance so um yeah, I think that's probably the state of play at the moment um, and what we have available, which, as you can see, none of which are really long-term, you know, curable, cure solutions. None of those things are. They're just to help people with managing the symptoms and trying to get them by for as long as possible. And what will happen if people that do have endometriosis keep putting off the surgery or refuse to get it looked at saying they don't have the time or I just have to put up with the pain what happens in the body and what does the endometriosis or what can it do yes um that's a great question and for some people you know some people's endometriosis might be quite slow progressing so what we believe endometriosis to be is a progressive kind of disease we start with a little bit and then it becomes a bit more then it becomes a bit more and then things start getting stuck um etc etc so it kind of progresses down that uh, that avenue now for some people you might go from you know a little bit to a lot of bit in a very short amount of time and for other people they may not and that could be subject to lots of different factors that I just alluded to and also just you know individual variation I think what we're beginning to appreciate is obviously the more the further along endometriosis gets in terms of its uh, stage and what's really important to note is that the correlation of the stage of endometriosis which is stages one two three and four does not correlate to the pain Somebody with stage one could be in agony and somebody with stage four can be walking around and have no idea they have endometriosis, got really nothing to do with it. And you would think if you've got an ovary up over here, you would be in agony. But like some people, it, again, it's a nervous system thing as well. We've got to factor that in. And so I think, I think the things to consider is, generally speaking, the more progressed the disease, 
the higher chance that um, fertility interventions may be required um, to conceive um, and also the loss of potential organs. So the more uh, significant the disease, sometimes ovaries cannot be saved. Sometimes ovaries are lost. Sometimes tubes are obliterated by endometriosis. Sometimes fallopian tubes are lost. I've seen appendixes be lost due to endometriosis. I've seen bowel resection, so a section of the large intestine be removed due to endometriosis. Some people end up with colostomy bags because they've lost so much of their bowel. Due to endometriosis, I've had I've seen clients with rectums um, be reconstructed due to endometriosis. People have lost kidneys, um, parts of their ligaments, um, urethra, urethras, um, all that can become compromised. Um, and these are very important and fine structures in the body that it is really hard to perform surgery on things that are really small. Um, and it, it comes with a potential complication of, of losing some of your organs. And those have then other consequences um, on your health and well-being. And I just think as well, from a, a non-physical aspect, like not getting an, like I always say, a diagnosis is therapy. Like as in feeling feeling validated and feeling heard and even just getting the diagnosis, I remember waking up and crying and my surgeon, because he said, we found endometriosis. I knew they had found something because they told me they would make four incisions. And they, I woke up to the nurse saying five incisions. And I was like, oh, oh they must have found something. And so the surgeon came in and he was like, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm okay. He's like, we found endometriosis. I got it all. Don't worry. And I just like started crying. Why are you sad? And I'm like, I'm not sad. I'm just happy. I'm not crazy. <laughs> and so I think that he's like, no, not at all. You're not crazy. It was there. It, it's, it's okay. It's all gone now. And so, you know, I think diagnosis is cathartic because then you can stop feeling like, oh, I'm looking to stuff to help me with maybe I have symptoms of endometriosis, but maybe I don't. So I'll just convince myself out of going to see an endometriosis dietitian or, oh, um, maybe I would go to acupuncture and I can tell them that I have endometriosis. Oh, but I don't really have endometriosis. So I'm just going to. And so as well, we start to tell ourselves the stories that society has told us internally, probably even worse. And so I think having that diagnosis being like, yes, I have endometriosis. Now I can take clear action to help and honestly, the amount of DMs that I get, people often in the hospital bed after surgery, they're like, I've been following you for ages, thinking I have endo, I've just had surgery, I have endo, when can I see you? It's a different mode that you go into once you have that answer. They're like, okay, I need to take action. Enough is enough. I have this diagnosis. Diagnosis is therapeutic in and of itself. And I think a lot of people choose not to get surgery because they feel like, it's not going to change anything for them. They're going to manage it like they have endometriosis. And if that's your informed choice, I'm happy with that for you if that's what you choose. But I like my personal opinion, like as in not my professional opinion, like my personal opinion is diagnosis is therapeutic. And I think it, it does have a positive impact on your life. And I think as well, we can't ignore the fact that there is always a chance that endometriosis can significantly progress to a point where organs might be compromised and nobody wants that. No, definitely not. Nobody in, even wishes for anyone to have to experience that. No. Um, my last question, my last thoughts for you is what advice or what suggestions would you give to someone that may be experiencing symptoms? Um, should they get help now? Who should they go see? Um, and what should they do? Oh, well, if you are one of these people that is listening to this and being like, whoa, <laughs> this might be me, um, it's okay to feel a bit overwhelmed and it's okay to feel a bit scared about the possibilities of like nobody's like, yay, signing up for surgery, like pumped, like duh, nobody wants that. But I just want you to not ignore the gut feeling because we all have gut feelings about our health right like 
And the more in tune you become with your body, I know it sounds so woo-woo, but the more you start to understand your body and the more that you start to listen to it instead of listening to what is out there and you start to give your body almost like a voice, the better, A, you will feel more aligned and B, the more progress you will make towards getting an answer. And so I think the first step that I would suggest before you even go and book your GP appointment, which you should do, but before you do that, I want you to sit down in the notes section on your phone or in a piece of paper and write down all your symptoms that you think might even be relevant. Even if you think like, oh, it's, it's, it's peripheral, just write down everything, write it all down and write down how it's impacting your life. Okay, and then start to keep track for a few weeks or a month or two months or three months or whatever, but start keeping track, keep a bit of a diary and start to collate data because at the end of the day, when you go and visit any healthcare professional, what do they want to know? Where's your blood test? Where's your reports? Where's your data? So as much as I want you to go in and be like, I feel this way, I have this gut feeling, have the data to back you. That's going to help you. So you can go in with like as much information as possible because every time you get rejected almost, um, it's like a rejection in a way, every time you get turned away and, and invalidated, that voice of, oh, maybe it's all in my head will get stronger. And so we want to try and not feed that as much as possible. So write everything down, keep a bit of a diary, book in to see your GP, have a conversation present your information, go from there. And then the next step would be to get a referral to see a gynecologist who has expertise in endometriosis surgery, not just any gynecologist. They really have to be like a member of AGES in Australia. Um, so it's the gynecology and oh, I can't remember what it stands for, but basically they're the ones that train people on how to do endometriosis surgery. Um, you want to make sure that they've got, uh, Nancy's Nook is a good place to have a look for endometriosis um, uh, surgeons. The problem in, with our system at the moment is right now, it's really hard for a consumer, a healthcare consumer, to work out whether this gynecologist or this gynecologist has training in endometriosis. And that's what's really hard because you don't just want anybody cutting you open and having a look because a lot of surgeons are still burning off endometriosis which is not good and not what we want because sometimes that can make the pain worse or obviously you haven't actually gotten it out so it's going to grow back much faster so we want to make sure that we're choosing surgeons who are going to excise the endometriosis who understand and work with endometriosis most of the time so it might not be your neighborhood gynecologist who's delivering the babies and doing pap smears and putting marinas in and taking marinas out you might need to go and see someone and wait a little bit longer to see someone who's an expert in endometriosis surgery so look it does take a little bit of research I know it shouldn't be like that I'm right there with you all but that is the state of play that's the reality so my tips would be data collect book a GP, referral to an endometriosis surgeon, do a little bit of research about who you're going to choose before you go to the GP. Don't just rely on the GP to give you a name. That would be my recommendations. Amazing. Well, great advice, especially for people that are unsure in this area. Um, I want to thank you so much for starting this conversation with me today and also doing everything that you were doing in your space. It is absolutely phenomenal knowing as well the journey that you've been on that now that you're able to help other people. Um, where can people find you um, online, on social media? Where can people give you a little follow? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Ash, and for the opportunity to share with everybody. So you can come and hang out with me for all things endometriosis at endo.dietitian. Dietitian spelt with all T's, everybody. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're searching for me. And you can come and hang out on our um, other account at the underscore dietologist. I talk more broadly about fertility and reproductive health there. And our website is thedietologist.com.au. And our podcast is Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast, and we talk about all things reproductive health, fertility and pregnancy there. So just head on over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and punch that in and you'll find us. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, as I said, for what you were doing in this space is phenomenal. I have honestly learned so much today and I am so I'm grateful glad. because it's just the conversation that I think we need to talk about a lot more, especially as women um, that are going through all similar symptoms and just normalise it. I think we need to start this yeah. conversation to say that it's not okay to experience um, the pain and the symptoms that we can experience. So thank yeah. you for doing that in this space. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks again, Ash. Really appreciate it. Good. Thank you as well to everyone else out there for joining us for another Secret Sunday session today. We will join you all again next week. Have a great day.